Hey, welcome back. In part one, we did the exterior condition assessment of Larry's 1953 Cessna 170B. So let's get right into part two where we pull some panels and talk some old tail draggers and doing a pre-buy. Joe, okay, enough war stories. Let's uh, pull open some panels. Let's see what's, uh, see what's on the inside of this 170. Yeah, I think we're gonna end up doing kind of abbreviated pre-buy enough to, at least enough to the point where we can get to if we, if we know we're gonna reject the airplane, you know? Yeah. Because the rest of the pre-buy is a whole report and yeah. estimates and. Now, you, you know, we kind of, looked at the engine, but you mentioned the oil analysis, which I, I thought was helpful, but what about compressions and scoping? Compressions are important. I mean, the reason the reason today we're not going to cover too much engine stuff is because the engines are kind of right or wrong, you know, and then an airframe is, is like an art. It's you know, somebody's rendition of what they think a 170 in this case should be or or how it's been modified and then maintained and then maintained wrong and then modified to suit it and this kind of cascade of consequences and solutions and you know we already had a nice first impression of this airplane and that that shine is dulled a little bit for me after looking at quite a bit of this uh stuff and seeing you know a lot of there was some damage that's been painted over and so what are you thinking as far as what where you want to look what panels are we take a look at what's your main well, concern? open up the extended baggage compartment i'm gonna look at the fuel selector i want to look at the gearboxes okay i'll show you some stuff on the belly that i didn't show you when we we're outside because it's still kind of trying to do a pre-flight sure you know and I'm, i just have a really critical pre-flight on when it was painted and then they moved it so there's a there's a shadow there this this right. was here Shadow. I'm not big into these beacons. I like the smaller ones, you know. Okay, now we're gonna get real. We're gonna get real critical. Um, oh, that's a cargo net. Okay. So let's take a look back here. Yeah. Thank you. I may you might want to be in my place. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so I would have taken this floor out. Okay, well, let me tell you the disclaimer. If it were me, I would take everything out, and every fastener and every rivet and all that, but that's, that's an extreme, right? But I would have recommended this person take this floor out. And I don't know why there's Cherry Maxes in every one of these, these rivets here. I don't know why they're all Cherry Maxes. There's even a Cherry Max there's a rivet that they drilled out and missed half of it, and then they put a Cherry Max in the hole anyway, so you'll get the camera on that. Okay. Um, just needs a little vacuum too. Um, let me take this coat off. It's hot. Okay. So this back here is prime, prime nice. I wonder why they did the, they did like some epoxy priming on the top of this. It looks like, uh, I don't know, I'll have to think about this one. What's this? Okay. Are you gonna put extended baggage in then, Larry? Um, if I can find one with, that allows the... Oh, the battery? Yeah. I mean, the 185 ones do. It's dimensionally the same back here. I'm and paperwork is okay? I don't know. No, I, I don't know. I don't know why they put this back here. I would have left it up there and put the Odyssey on. And, and, and not, it's not as even much for the battery, but the, circ, the raw circuitry that's running under this floor right now with no protection is one of the real reasons I, I don't like it back here. You chafe that wire, you're starting fires. So I don't like it. It looks like they did a good job though. All these wires look new, you know? It, it was done, for putting the battery back here, it was done. It's actually kind of interesting. It's the firewall mounted battery. What paperwork did they have to put this back here? It's our AFCON conversion. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they used the firewall mounted battery box and they just riveted a flange to it and they put it back here. Um, okay, well, I need you, Larry, to run the trim for me. Which way? Uh, forward. I don't know if you can. 
You could also just clamber in there if you want. Okay, that looks like you're good. Okay, run the trim. Is that the stop? On the way. Okay, other way. All the way, keep going. Okay, that good? Yep. Okay. Okay, elevators. Full? Yeah, full. Full. Okay. Okay, down. Okay. Back. Okay, forward. Okay, and then rudder. Rudder again. Again. Um, okay, elevator again. Okay, that's fine. Trim again. I'll have to open that. I'll have to open that and panel back there. Larry, that's that's fine for now on this. Kyle, is it the flange along the side of the vert vertical that you need pulled? I need that round inspection panel on the right side pulled. This will be kind of a cool shot. You'll see a you'll see a whole sky hole opening up. It's a jug head. Look at that. You ever stuck your elbow into a giraffe's <laughs> vagina? <laughs> you seen that movie? No. Oh, never mind. That. <laughs> if you don't have the context, yes, yes. <laughs> then now, if you talk about artificially inseminating cows, I could have related. <laughs> but I got giraffe a vaginas, no. Zebra. This took a weird turn. <laughs> It's a movie. I was just okay. waiting for your sweatshirt and elbow to get stuck in there. <laughs> we were going to renegotiate some work prices. <laughs> How can you renegotiate beyond free, Jughead? We're going to do other work. I'm going to pay you we're other work. He's going to buy you, <laughs> buy you pizza. <laughs> okay, so I see a problem here. Clupper. You have a... I've never seen it, but... The the uh, turnbuckle, one of the brass was it brass? Is it brass? It looks like they're brass. One of these gold turnbuckles here on your elevator cable has a crack starting down it on the threads. Um. So yeah, that's not good. If that lets go, you're dead. That's pretty easy fix though. Bonanza's just had a AD bunch of ADs on their turnbuckles. Same reason. And you got a crack in the elevator support. Right here, Steve. Don't freak out. Come on over. Oh, okay. You can feel that. I can feel it. And there's a crack here. And I can see that one. And it's a crack? This is a, here's a crack here. So that's where. So this here? Jughead, put, drop those elevators here, watch. Drop them. See it? Okay, just slam it down again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what that's how that crack happens that I like to put in a number, like a number 10 screw with a washer and everything with a crack there you're gonna need to double it up so so Steve look mm -hmm. in here and okay. Jughead will do the elevators again this is how this crack happens let me is, see which is better what, what am I looking at see that crack yeah okay so when Jughead drops the elevators it fries on that one. Uh, right yeah, there. yeah, yeah. And the, the skin just do it. gives out. Well, I don't want you to do it too much, but. Yep. Hold on, I'm trying to get that. There we go. Is it it's just ahead of that rivet? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then this, this turnbuckle down here, I don't know if you can zoom in enough to see it. There you go. That's a cool shot. So, 
I don't know how much you can zoom in, but it's that bottom turnbuckle on the this. left side, which is the back side of it. It's got a little hairline crack going. And it looks like they put in new cables, but used the old turnbuckles see, and ends. This won't give us more access to it. We'll no. look at bulkheads right there. Okay. Let's see. Let's send the biggest guy down the tail to film it. Ouch. <laughs> oh, that just like tweaked my, like I got a back cramp on it. It's good. Okay, so that, I think we might be able to see it. Is this all that zooms? Yeah. Anyways, that lower turnbuckle's got a little hairline crack in the back of it. And they didn't take out the, 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 the bell crank. They just, they didn't even change the hardware in it. They didn't disassemble it at all. They just left the bell crank in there. They left the rod ends to it. They left the turnbuckle on it. And then they changed the cables. So, cables are good. I, I mean, come on, it's 70 year old hardware. Like, it's not, it's not that big a deal to change it, you know? I just don't know why you wouldn't. I did do the trim pulley though, which it's like the hardest one to do. Mm. Jughead, run the elevator. More. Hold it there. Hey Jason, come here real quick. Go tube, see how it's connected with the bell crank there? Yep. You can wiggle that back and forth. Tell me what you think of that be that bearing feels like. The uh, the one that's so, in the... Yeah, the blue tube that's yep. actually in those, it's connected to that green thing. Okay. And that there's that old bolt is the is where the bearing is. So feel that left and right. Tell me if you think that bearing's going. I don't, yeah, because that's the bell crank. Yeah, but doesn't, the, the bell crank feels like it's walking left and right. Too. Yeah, it's it's not supposed to be tippy like that. Because those are, because you just, that's the, you just took those bearings out, or, or similar, so. Yeah, those are, those are needle, those are needles, so they're not supposed to have, they're not supposed to have that any radial just be play. laser yep. straight, right? Yep, there, there would be, there may be some axial, play on the bolt yeah, itself left and right but not right. radial yeah not not a not a spherical type movement engineer well, i'm impressed <laughs> i'm just a mechanic <laughs> he knows all this stuff <laughs> okay well bad otherwise yeah I, but that's an easy fix again i think i have a i can show you what the bearing looks like actually all right you're on the regular that's that's the pivot bearing. Okay. So that's that's needle, and that that shouldn't have any shouldn't have any radial play in it. This should just be for rotation. And then the one at the where the rod end attaches is a bigger bearing, um, but I can't feel any radial um, or spherical type movement allowed in that one either. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> if there's play in there, then either the bores that the bolts are going through are worn or the bearing itself is worn out, right? And that attaches to that belt crank, or that's the- Yeah, the, 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 pivot, the, that's pivot the pivot point that we're, mm -hmm. we're feeling the play around is, okay. is right about the, the axis here. And the, the rod end is attached up at this end here, mm -hmm. right? And so we're feeling movement like this at this point, which yeah. would be in that bearing that it shouldn't exist. Got it. Yeah, it's, it, it's the black mark right there. That's the thing, the crack? That one, yeah. Might take, I'll get, might take actually crawling down there to verify whether it's a crack or it just a scratch. It looks well, to me like a scratch. It looks yeah. in this photo like a scratch, but when I look at it with my own eyes, it looks like a crack. Either way, you got you got stuff to do back there with that bearing. It does look a little scary. It seems a little scary first, but I like to just go slow. That's not supposed to be a bolt. Right there. See that? Yeah. That's supposed to be a pin like this one. And it's 
it's hitting in just the right situation like that it's it's hitting that cover okay that the uh, bolt down here nope on the right right here nope down down oh i see it right there so that's okay. supposed to be a pin okay i see it here I and since it's now. not it's taking the interior with it when you do the actuate the brakes oh yeah 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 so you know that's kind of a flag wingtips what that's kind of a problem with these. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and then just like you have designer, the flag would be inside the structure. That's it right there. Okay. And then maybe. No, that's it. So it should just be three. Okay. So, Jughead, you got three eight? Can you get three eights out of the top drawer of my box? We're gonna go over here and take a look at one of my favorite spots. So that's one of my favorite spots. This goes over there. Um, these rudder springs have had them snap before. He's got the lightweight rudder springs in there. That's not a seaplane, so of course he does. Uh, Larry, you're up there. Push the brakes. Push the brakes. Yeah. Okay, now now pedals then. All the way, deflection. Keep going. That's okay, uh again forward. Back. And one more time forward. And back. Okay, that's that's good. Go ahead. So, the 170 is light and built lighter than the 180. I see a lot more problems in early 180s because they're they're uh, they're a light. They're like a 170 in construction, um, really light. But then they've got this heavy duty stuff like rudder springs and engines that are too heavy for the mounts and. Um, you know, trim stuff, and, and they figured it out in the later 180 and the 185. And the unfortunate thing is, the early 180, for its lightness, is like the best, but it's it's underbuilt to a fault. So, is there a year that they kind of figured it out? Um, it's the I don't know the year. It's the G model. Okay. And on. Okay. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, the G model and on, they figured it out. It might be the F, but I think it's the G. Okay. Uh, Larry, can you do the yokes for me? Elevator pull. Should I take a GoPro here? Sure. It's recording. Okay. Elevator pull or push. Back. Okay. Runner, push. Okay. Back. Runner again. Back. Okay. Here you go. Oh, that's looking our, oh, sorry, uh, ailerons. Back. And then, uh, ele uh, uh, rudder one more time. Okay. Good. So this thing's, it's dirty. It's, you know, for, for a restoration, I, I don't, I'm not particularly pleased with how they just kind of went on the surface and didn't, they dig deeper. I like the, I like that they, they replace all the cables, but when you replace all the cables and don't replace like, the hardware that holds the cables. I mean, you know, come on. It's been sitting there for 70 years. Uh, the rudder springs are starting to cut through the the torque tubes a little bit, which actuate them, the, the spring that re returns it. Mm -hmm. But we got a long way to go before they become a serious issue. Um, 
if we pull them out of an airplane, we just you know we just address it, make it a round hole again. They're becoming slotted. Mm. Um, yeah, it's just kind of like why why would you do all this and not clean it up in here and and stuff? I mean, you got to look at it when you annual it. So um, I wonder what's going on here. Why that? Frankly. The bottom still is the bolts just like yours, but you get really fast with it. I have a ratchet wrench that all it all it does is belong to my seat. Okay, and how difficult is it to put it back on? Uh, it takes about three, four minutes to take my lower seat out, and it probably takes about eight, ten minutes to put it in because they never line up totally straight. We got a secret jump seat STC in the works. Ready? It's called Versatilius Maximus. I'm not kidding. Okay. That's the project. Okay, so we slide the seats all the way forward and then it becomes a little bit of a wrestling match. And the trick is to be careful that you don't scratch windows or anything with these. So we're going to kind of just gently move the seat back. And one side will start to come up. Don't scratch the window. Yep. <laughs> Trying real close. Somebody already did. Yeah. See, and this is what's nice when you don't have the seat back on. You don't have to worry about that. Because what we're trying to do here is now get past, turned. There it is. There we go. Okay. Then pull all that forward for me. I don't want to scratch his. Jackman's got it. Right on, now it's a pickup truck. And you take this bolt out, yeah. and you get these quick release 3 8 inch pins. I'll send you an article on how to get them. And um, it's just got a little ring. So you can reach in there and just pull it. I'll show you. Let's go look at oh, mine on here. Next time you're at my hangar, I'll show you. Okay. So I, if I was you, when you go home, well, like, do you want your rear seat in right now or take it out? Uh, I'll... Yeah, so when you go home, I wouldn't even put the rear seat. I wouldn't bolt it in. I'd just set it back yeah, yeah. and take it home. That was the plan, yeah. yeah. There it is. These are nice. So take that out and then take the seat out. You pull on both sides? Yeah, I, I would actually. That's what you want to do. So the front will come off. Oh, these things are flipping. Okay, so one design flaw on the 170, they fixed on the 180 is the, the arm the gear creates on the gearbox comes back and compresses the weakest point nearest to the hard point. So it tends to kick the gear back and indent this area here. And we've actually got quite a bit of indentation. And I'll show you on the 180 over here how they fix this problem. But I like to put a doubler from about there back and pick this up. And what they've actually done is I don't know why they took a hammer all the way back here, but somebody's banged this out. Mm. This was probably a very oil can, so at one point somebody banged this out. Um, yeah, I, I see doublers here a lot, and I think it's a really good thing. The best thing the 180 did is they took this little strap of the door post, and they came back here with it, and then they came up through here with it. So it really picks up all this stringers and provides a nice transition of the strength. It doesn't have to be that strong back here. It's just it's just here, and it's really all or and all and nothing. And it really should be something between that to bleed that load out. Um, so you can really see it here, where it's where it's come back, you know. And even since it's been painted, it's 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 been stressing, you know. So that's one thing you really look at. Inside, when we look inside here, you can see that stringer is bent. Oh, internally 
So, and it's probably the same on the other side too. But that's one big design flaw on the 170. So just take a doubler. I, I like to take the strut out, go up here under the door hinge, come back down. I, I've come over here to the step before and come up and it makes it really nice and thick when you get 64 thousandths there. I don't know, see it. I don't know what, I don't know why. Well, there's definitely some door fit issues. There are definitely some door fit issues. I think these are... These I mean, are not 170 doors. I don't... I, and this I, look at this. Well, I know I saw that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, one, I'm still wondering if they're 170 doors with that the newer latch. Newer latches. Yeah. The other thing they I, are 170 doors. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Is how'd they get the six-inch windows without the auxiliary stop? Well, because they have this thing. So this is a 170 door. They put the latch in. If if it wasn't a 170 door, it would have the holes for the other latch in it. For that flip latch, I think. But I, all the other bubble windows one I've seen has that secondary down here. Above the two inch, you're, you're recommended to have it. Oh, recommended? I think is it's the word? recommended. Okay. Yeah, you're supposed to have two. And I think it's mostly because you can, I think what part of it is bad door seals or because you can also flip that thing and the window just flies open yeah. at 150 miles an hour. I told Larry not to open these at all. <laughs> like, that's a big kite. Yeah, so that stringer's bent a little bit. That fuel selector usually is on a I know. table, and the the selector has a knuckle in it. Yeah. And so I think, and here's the thing, the 185 has a fuel selector, and its location is here. The fuel selector itself, the location is like right in here. It's up above the floor. Okay. And it, and it looks just like this. But I think, I don't think that's the case here. I think this is just the knuckle going down and making a bend. There's not really, I don't think, a problem with it. I mean, it's similar to what 185 is. You can't be, you know, too angry about it. Um, but it's just very interesting, you know. So I want to take a look. The more we look, the more we see, the more I want to find. I want to move that finger down there, too, in that gear well. What finger? That you were talking about. Oh yeah, it's the stringer. Okay. okay, and what don't you like on this one? Well, the, I'm just saying that the 170 period, the engineering's flawed and that stringer ends up taking all the load and it can't. Oh, so you didn't see one particularly wrong on this one? Well, it's just got the damage that they all do have, right? It's, it's got that indentation outside the gearbox. The gearbox tries to tweak back and the cabin stays. Gotcha. You got like a quarter inch of metal going into 32,000, Jughead. Yeah, that- And steel. That little- Yeah, well, it curves that, down. that yeah. curve isn't supposed to be there. I'll show you the 180 Correct. and we've got the floor out of it. So you can see, if you zoom in here and we look at this, maybe you have to use the GoPro. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the 180, you'll see the difference is that this, this is a steel angle in there where it meets it, the 170's all weird up in, up in here. And the 180's not because it has an external, this 64,000, it's bleeding out that stress. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Larry, I'll get you the air vac before you go today. Okay. I'll get you the vacuum before you go. Vacuum? Yeah, I'll get you the air vac. You can suck all some of this dirt out yeah. and stuff. One thing I really like, I think is necessary on all of them, is the uh, uh, lifting eye bolts on the top of the airframe, and then the shameless plug for ourselves. We make a handle that adapts into handles or an adapter that adapts into handles. Um, but you can pick those up. You can pick the airplane up and actually check the gear in the shims. Um, otherwise, it's really hard to manage the airplane. And jacking up the airplane is usually accomplished on the gear that you're trying to shim, or it's on this weird like stilts kind of thing. And I'm not real keen on it. But uh, yeah, so these shims in here, 
the way this gearbox there's a bolt through the back of the gear the the rear gearbox back here is a bolt through it to retain the leg this way onto the airplane and then these shims here keep the leg from bouncing up and down jiggling in the slot that's larger than it than itself mm -hmm. okay so um, these are the shims there and so you tighten those up to keep this guy from bouncing up and down if it makes sense you're prying it down you've now made the gearbox too small for the gear and it's, it, it works well but Larry can you shake check for clearance and shake these wings like on the tip like hard like you just landed on a beach if you can break the airplane great <laughs> he'll fix it I heard it well <laughs> break it here Okay. Okay, so those are they're looking pretty good. Um, take a look at the other side. Yeah. So it's looking pretty good when I can see the gear leg flexing but not moving. Good. That's what we want to see. These stringers here are load bearing stringers for the engine. And we've been finding a lot of them cracked lately, especially on 180s. But the 175 is prone to them as well. The 170 is not as bad for some reason. Um, I just checked this out. It's got a doubler in it for some reason. I, I, I can't find out why. I can only see back to about here. Um, do you want to, can you pull that interior panel? We could look and see if there's doubler keeps going. Mm. Is that the side of that tunnel? Yeah. It's a rebuild. They rebuilt it. Every time. We rebuilt it means we did every cosmetic thing. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we got that drip mat somewhere, Jason. Are you using it? Uh, no, this is a chewed up piece, eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah something that kind of manufactured. It wasn't that great a job. What's that? All that trim piece they decided to produce right oh Jack, can you one. grab that from him Sorry. grab what oh here oh plug for en at grip mat these things are great they're awesome i just ordered the three pack i thought i heard trent palmer's plugging those recently Was he? yeah trent's a sellout <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I'm kidding. I, I like them. They're awesome. Yeah, so there's a doubler on that. There's quite a big doubler oh, wow. on, on yeah. that. So. Yeah. I wonder why. Hmm. What do you know? Oh, well, this airplane was ground loop in 1976 or something like that. I don't know why you didn't tell, why didn't you tell me that in the beginning of this. That's fine. That's good that you probably didn't. Oh, can you, um, can you, can you pull this real quick too? I kind of like it. I don't see a problem with it. Maybe, you know, human factors might have an issue with it <laughs> being, you know, angled, but the 185 was that way, so they can't have too big of a problem with it. Yeah. We did find, our problem here, this mm -hmm. is a doubler, mm -hmm. and it's because this is cracked right there. Yeah, but it's got the doubler on it, so it's kind of a weak doubler. They could have done better at this.
These are upside down, which is kind of funny. I don't, maybe they had the wing upside down when they put the stole kit on and they put that in right side up, but okay. this should be down oh. and this should be up. But the fix for that is I like to cut, I like to cut them rectangular and wider because you get more airflow. Okay. Everything here is correctable. So it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, your biggest disappointment is that it's was claimed to be a overhauled or a well it's not it never claimed to be overhauled they just said complete, complete rebuild which is rebuild okay so complete restoration which is this which they didn't do really a bad job it's just complete to the definition of the person who did it says it's complete and therefore they're they're not wrong so it's um whereas, a bit subjective <laughs> it's subjective to their own interpretation jughead all and then our complete is actually a complete overhaul, which is a defined term with the FA where it has to be disassembled and reassembled to a spec. This is just disassembly, cosmetic fixes, and then reassembled. What Jason's doing is the beginning of a complete overhaul. Every fastener is coming out of the airplane, disassembled completely to a spec, as I said. This rebuild, as they called it, which is just still in the category of restoration or complete restoration or whatever, is such a subjective term you just don't know what it is until you look at it and i can tell you they didn't do anything with the wings they didn't do any of the flight controls they basically just took the interior out of the airplane painted it replaced the cables put the interior in or redid the interior and did a nice panel and, and i think they did the engine at that time i don't have anything really bad to say about it but it's just an old airplane that's been damaged that you know it's not it's not perfect by any means it's it's airworthy. Um, if this were an annual, I would have grounded it for a couple things um, before I signed it back off as airworthy. Um, but, you know, um, it's an old airplane that needs a little maintenance, so nothing, nothing too bad here. Oh, I do have a big one, actually. Here's one. These are non-structural. These have to be structural. Ooh. Yeah. How do you know they're non-structural? They're stainless little beautiful fasteners. So... Larry, did you get that? These are wrong aileron screws. Oh, okay. okay, they gotta be structural. AN525, 10R, probably eight. Sportsman stole the only way to go on a Cessna wing. Yeah. Who makes it? Steen Aviation. Give Will a call up in Montana. He'll nice. set you up. And then get it up here to get it installed. I think these guys probably install more of these stole kits than anybody. What's that made of, you know? What's that? What's that made of? Foam. Yeah, that's just a piece of foam block, yeah. basically. Yeah. So what it is, is the way this works, is this is a non-structural addition. Okay. Um, you can see it right here. So, this is what gets riveted to the front, mm -hmm. is this new piece of airfoil. Mm -hmm. And the, the foam blocks here is what's providing the strength to it. Um, and so, it's it's actually a non-structural rivet that you can use. And it increases, you know, it increases, I forget the total, four feet? Yeah. Uh, I think it's four inches and four feet. Okay, four inch cord and then four feet span? Four foot area. Four feet. Area, okay. Area. Got it. Is it eight total or four? I can't remember. This is the improvement on the 180 that they did oh, yeah. for that. So instead okay. of just dropping right there, it comes all the way back here and it really helps a lot. You can see internally there's none of that, none of that damage. Sure. Like on the 170, so. Okay. Victor XR IO 555 VII Black Edition 7 VII or whatever. Going into a 180, huh? Going into a 180. <laughs> and it's going to have 185 extended wings on it. So we're going to have 88 gallons of fuel with extended wings, <laughs> with a ski kit, an Anfib kit, mm. um, a G3X. The panel in that one's going to mm. look like this one. 
So this one's getting a Dynon panel. We designed this whole panel frame and everything. Um, so we, we didn't raise the panel at all. We just bumped out the corners, but instead of the two Dynons, this one's gonna have, that one's gonna have G3Xs. Mm -hmm. Um, X, okay, so two. I'm, I think I'm doing a G3X. I think he's only going to do mine. one G3X, but he might change his mind. Okay. Um, what it is, it's, we're going to make it one G3X and then like an iPad with the option for the second G3X. Sure. You know? Okay. So I'll have like a cover plate with an iPad mount. Yeah, nice. But uh, might be a good thing for me we're to reinforcing do. Reinforcing the whole thing. Every skin's new. It's the full bush liner overhaul. What um, what GPS like a GNX 750XI 750XI of course, because <laughs> because why not? Yep, and then and then we're about out of room, so we got a remote mount the transponder and the sure, com com sure. two yeah. and audio panel, and then a, a the GF or what is it GFC 500 the autopilot the 500 autopilot the 500 yeah. That's, I'm going to um, put the 507, which is experimental version of that in mind, and then the GNX, was it, 375, which is the GPS Plus uh, transponder, which is interesting. Let me tell you about this jig, too. So we, Yeah, please. We were just in here Christmas Eve and other things. We set this up originally. We didn't have the laser, and now we do, and their thing was take a straight edge, Put a straight edge on that and then have the straight edges hang over right so you see my finger here so yep. on the other side also have that and then set the straight edge on that straight edge mm -hmm. and level all four points mm -hmm. you, you know what i'm saying you'd have this yeah. straight edge this way and then that way yeah and then that way and then that way and you have this quad ball leveling thing and we did pretty good the problem is then you're supposed to take a piece of twine and stretch it. Yeah, see, there's a problem. And, and then go all the way over to here. And then you're supposed to take like a piece of warm pizza and set it on the string and then see how much it deflects over the, you know, the course of things and then blow on it or something. Some, <laughs> some ridiculously inaccurate way of doing, I mean like, it's accurate in theory, and then you actually go to do it, and it's like, this has so much play in it. It's, I just threw the pizza thing in there. <laughs> Must but be it, lunchtime. But it does say, take an, yeah, we're having, it does say, take an old fuselage you just have laying around and stick it in, that'll help. Well, this fuselage is off to the left of center by an inch and a quarter, and then it's also, it, it's not high, I thought it was high, it's low by half an inch. So you come back here and look at it. This thing, let me back up a little bit. This scribe line right there, that silver one, silver one's Sharpie, Okay. but there actually is a physical scribe in the metal. Mm -hmm. That scribe line is completely center on the, on not the center of the peg over there, but on the tops of them, because you're supposed to set the straight edge on. So on the top of the peg, is le it's level within we can't even measure the tolerance, how level wow. this and those four points are over there. One, two, three, four okay. on that. So this is totally level. Sure. Then down here, we've got another peg right in the middle of the fuselage. Yep. There's one on the forward gate as well. I'm sure you'll B-roll and cut that in. Sure. There's one on the forward gate and you sight line those back to this. And this is sighted up the center of it. We did it, but we actually did it both ways from back and front. To okay. make sure we were completely true on this tube. Mm -hmm. So we, I put these little drill marks in, mm -hmm. but we're we're center on those. There's ones in the front we're center on, and then this has also been centered here with our drill marks. Sure. Because this is on slots, and so just to have the ability for the screw to turn, it's got a little bit of play in it. So these center, center, perfect. Um, and it doesn't look like the uh, airplane is centered. And this, the airplane is not. The airplane's off by an inch and a quarter this way, yeah. and then down three eighths or a half inch. Any damage history? No, this is factory for sure. Mm -hmm. And I can show you exactly where. Um, mm -hmm. Step around the right door. So we're documenting all this, and Jason's the one to show you. But he and he's got the math written out. He's an engineer. I'm not. But if you take an inch and a quarter times. I think this is like 144 inches. 
How much does it take to throw it off an inch and a quarter? It takes like, I think three eighths was actually more like um, a whole two inches. So it's less than three eighths of an inch uh, to throw it off by an inch and a quarter over that distance. And right here, you can see center point of the aircraft here. Actually, first look at this side. Okay. Okay. And then I want you to note two things. First, you can see this skin here. See it? Yeah. Okay. Then we got the center point of the aircraft. We can't see any. Then you got this coming out, oh, kind of similar to this, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's your down. This is this is the you know eighth inch three sixteenths down. But here's the thing. So that's that's our down angle. That's why we're low. Look at this rivet here and that skin underlap. Okay, not much, a little bit. You can see it's starting to, you know, we're starting to track with our negative angle here on our tail. Uh -huh. Look at this one. It's like a quarter inch. Yeah. So that's a down angle and our left angle happening uh, right sure, here sure. where this tail was put onto this cabin section. Um, and both of this, all this math lines up. If you take this much times it by that distance, you're going to be a half inch low. Wow. Take this much times that distance, you're going to be a half inch. So or, you uh, found the, the manufacturing defect that caused the twist. Or this the, is horrible. We'd get, yeah. you know how much trouble we'd get in if we did this? Yeah. Like we, well, what year is this? 59. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I feel like I mean, they, I don't know what it was. Not but, to make excuses for them, but slide rules and, uh, I don't know. Well, it's, it's somebody did the jig setup. I, sure. I, well, my thought is, is all of FAJ is a floor assembly jig. So all the aircraft built in FAJ such and such between this time and the time they moved it and recalibrated it. Because mm -hmm. every time we, if we were to move this even a foot, we'd have to recalibrate the whole thing. Sure. It's a pain in the butt. But there's probably, I would not, there, there's no way that this is the only airplane that was built like yeah. this. Yeah. And then, that, because what they probably did is exactly what the Cessna manual says, is take a fuselage, shove it in there, set the jig up around it. Well, we've centered all this out. We've ran our laser sight here. We, we put a point here too. So this is our one of our laser points. Okay. Trammel points, laser points. We have lasers now. We went to the center of the spar. We went to this point, we went to this point. Guess where the center of the firewall is? Not that point? It's over here. <laughs> so this, up to this, this is a split. This isn't, this isn't an, a, an official reference point because it's just a split okay. in, this, in this skin thing here. Sure. But this, what it is, is the firewall completely in itself is perfect except for the four points of the engine, it's perfect except it's moved over by half an inch three eighths oh okay, yeah wow so this that. is the engine attached bolt mm -hmm. that's yeah like a crescent moon there yeah so you can imagine our frustration trying to get this in sure we got it in the tail is way off over there and then we get it in this way and, the, and now it's straight the spars are straight the strut fittings are straight <laughs> so our cabin section is about all that's good so how are you going to straighten it out uh, it's all coming apart anyway yeah suppose we were just trying to calibrate where this airplane is right now right this is a factory oh, wow. one of the factory jigs yeah. we we're just trying to purely calibrate where is this airplane now mm -hmm. what are we starting with versus what are we you know kind of a control like how fast was it going before you know we have all this data from its previous life and now it's gonna fly straight what you'd have then is you'd have probably rig in some rudder input to kick the tail back over the way it should be. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have to counteract that with a roll input. Otherwise you're gonna be flying it like this with a little yaw. Well, with this bigger than designed engine, a 555, whatever, Victor, XYZ, yeah. Victor 7. <laughs> but Vic are, you gonna, are you gonna add in like um, two degrees right, two degrees down to counter, you know, to add in some yaw? So actually we're just, yeah. So it's a it's a standard 550 conversion. Okay. And then okay. you're setting the 555 yeah. Victor XR Black Edition Seven. <laughs> it's a cool name. It sounds like like an old English like 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 Queen Victoria type of you know realm of the <laughs> first yeah, yeah, Roman numerals. Seven. Yeah. Exactly. It just I mean it's, I don't know. It sounds cool. I can't ever say the name. Engines this long. 
It's a five. It's a five fifty. It's a five fifty E. Okay. With with bigger cylinders. Mm -hmm. That the picture on their website is actually six of the cylinders, and they lit up the bellies of them to make it look like the tail end of a rocket booster. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's badass. <laughs> and the owner goes, you know, I'm talking myself into this once in a lifetime indulgence. Let's do the. You know, I, I try not to have an opinion. I mean, I really was hoping he would, but I try to just say, like, your airplane, do what you want. He said, what would you do? I said, well, I'd, I'd do it. Why not? So, <laughs> yeah, whatever airplanes did with their conversion is going to be what goes on here. Okay. Like the seaplanes, west engine mount, just like that one. Okay. Um, Speaking of this one, this is the uh, 520, you said? That's a P-Pong. 470-50 built out of a 520 case. Whoa, P-Punk? Yeah. P-Punk is, uh, yeah, they take a 470 and put 520 jugs on it. So okay. it's a lightweight four, It's a lightweight 520. Okay, nice. Or you can just use a normal 520 and put a carburetor on it. Mm -hmm. Is essentially what it is. It's, a, it's either an IO 520 that's carbureted or it's an O470 with 520 jugs. So, Kind of six one half dozen the other, except the 520 case is heavier, right. which was the whole point of the P-Ponk was to get away from that. Hmm. But it's also more robust. And this guy really wants the heavier case because when he flew up here, he flew up here for a window change and it turned into this. And <laughs> his case was cracked. Oh the cam gosh. had rust. Four out of the six cylinders, no, I think it was five out of six cylinders had something wrong with it. And like one of the cylinders was like airworthy, like you'd actually fly it. I think it was low or something. I can't remember at this point. But uh, yeah, so so he opted for the P-Bunk. It's, it's a lean, mean conversion with a carburetor and, and some guys like carburetor. I prefer fuel injection and electronic ignition. A lot of guys like their carburetors and their mags and that's fine. But we also took that into consideration. We built our panel and we designed the panel for these these older aircraft that have all these new options available as we, we we designed it to be more universal. If you want electronic mags ever, fine. And here it is, you know, it's it's done. Um, is this something you guys do on all your... Uh, that is pretty. that is a kind of a special request done by this guy. He wanted this firewall engine turned. And what's what's cool about it, I think the coolest feature of it is there's no way you can do this um, with the firewall installed in the aircraft. Right. You have to do sure. it pre-assembly, mm -hmm. you have to do it before you put rivets in it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're going to end up with a really ugly, inconsistent pattern. Um, and this is all done by hand and it's a, it's one of the biggest pains in the butt to do ever. It's pretty though. Um, yeah. Steven here is building harnesses for our next gen panels. Oh, great. Um, oh. This is, right now, he'll show you, but it's a, this is the mounting plate for all the harness plugs. Um, so that goes behind the left glove box in these panel frames here. It goes behind the left glove box and then it sticks up above where that L-shaped hole uh, is. Sure, yeah. So you can actually reach in and plug the switch plate in and it's just, just about that simple to, to get these installed. So this will be back here. Mm -hmm. It's got a nice big pigtail that's going to receive the panel. The switch plate itself has a pigtail as well. Okay. Um, that way you can't mess up the wiring. We don't leave anything to chance. That's great. So. Okay. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of avionics planning for my home built and uh, it's very intimidating so kudos on uh, G3X. G3X, uh, GNC3, no, GNX 375. It's got the transponder. It's even harder to design something that's universal to accept any of them. So we, we try right. to, right? eventually we can't. So I don't know if that's something you wanted to go into on the video, but we had an interesting, Kyle and I had an interesting phone conversation about STCs and avionics that are approved, um, one-offs, but then they become this Frankenstein that uh, I kind of gave the analogy of the F-15 over years and years of getting upgrading radios, um, LRUs, radars, screens, etc and no thought was put into um, human factors. And so while the FAA may approve, or TSO, I say STC, it's TSO uh, a, a product to go into a plane, but they didn't necessarily have that in mind of 15 years later of hodgepodging these Frankenstein avionics. So yeah. uh, is that a challenge that you have? Uh, it is, um, kind of what the thing is too, is if, 
What's funny is if you have a, let's say you have a mechanic and he's been maintaining this airplane for 20 years. This is kind of new stuff that I found out a couple weeks ago because they're starting to get cranky. They I mean, I say that yeah, as endearingly as possible because we have a really good FISDO here, really good inspectors. They're themselves not cranky. Regulation wise is what I'm kind of defining as cranky because you've got these avionics and you had a six pack in this plane and that screen goes where that six pack went and that screen now is supposed to have redundancy you're supposed to have radios it doesn't have it, you know the stuff that was there maybe there was a fuel gauge there that it blanks out well now the screen has the fuel gauges but you're gonna have to move um, well okay now you don't have a switch that controlled things that were there so we're gonna remove that switch well, to consolidate the panel and make it reasonable, we're gonna take all these switches and we're gonna move them over. Well, now we have extra room, so we're gonna put another gauge there. We're gonna put an autopilot header here. Well, now we don't have room for our AnFib pump that we just might as well install at the same time, so we're gonna put it up here. Mm. Like, and, and all that kind of stuff is where we came in and designed a universal panel for these Cessnas, mm. 180, 172, 182, and 180, well, 180, 180, 182, and 185 of that vintage, and then the 172, and then also the wide 182. We did an approach that just took all those variables and eliminated them by having a standard panel frame ba uh, base control panel, and then a, a panel frame that had enough clearance in it to do whatever you really want, um, and then keep it in the same specific category to where you used to have, you had a radius panel, and that PFD that you want to put in place of the six pack is now way off center like this. And so then your radios are way off center like this. And then anything that was over there is now gonna just, I don't know. It becomes a mess. And we're really glad we did it because right after we finished um, our first panel here, the FAA goes, we were tolerating the people kind of when an airplane just evolved over the course of 20 years and eventually it's a completely different panel. But this but, full overhaul. Well, the full, the full overhaul that you guys are doing Maybe we're the solution that created the cause, but there was already kind of a cause and then we just came out with a, a good answer for it. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, you guys need to have a flight manual supplement. Luckily we like your panel better than anything that Cessna did because that was all over the place and scattered. Sure. Uh, so that's pretty simple. But the problem that's gonna happen on, and not our fault at all is that people who just say, I'm gonna build this beautiful white panel. It's got all these gauges moved all over the place because I like it better. The FAA is gonna start going, you need a flight manual supplement, you need a flight manual supplement, you need a flight manual supplement. And it's not, you know, it's not gonna be kind to a lot of people. I mean, a lot of avionics shops do flight manual supplements. They're not like the biggest deal to do. I'm just kind of concerned for when 5,000 people need a flight manual supplement all at the same time. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be really I don't know if it's gonna be now, in one year, in 10 years, but it's really gonna be a pain in the butt for these guys who now can't really fly their airplane without a piece of paper that tells them how to use the airplane that they designed yeah. the mod to. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, what it is, is it's it's just a good thing for us and other people that we're doing these yeah. these panels. So we're excited. Yeah. And uh, this is, so this is our 172 panel. And 172 has had four different versions of flaps. They had manual flaps, they had 30 and 40 degrees of flaps and they had just this lever switch that was a momentary. And so we designed the panel frame as consistent as we could and then we have these blanking plates. This is a 40. And these plates go in in here and if they had manual flaps, this would be blank. If they had 30 degrees of flaps, this would be similar but but not quite as far down for the, the, sure. the 40. Okay. If they had just the switch, it'd just be a little round so hole it's there. Kind of modular, it's standardized but it's modular. The frame standardized mm -hmm. and a lot of it a lot of it circles around approvals. That way we can say, this is approved. If you have a 172B model, which is the first panel, this the first airframe this will fit in, then you just don't have flaps here. And you know we're gonna call that out. Your circuit breakers are always gonna be there. Your throttle's always gonna be here. Your mixture's always gonna be, well, there. Your prop's gonna be there if you have one. Um, alternate static is a good idea, so we're lumping that in. If you didn't have one already, it's kind of a gray area whether you're supposed to have it or not because you're supposed to have it if you're IFR, but if you didn't already have it, now you're changing the pedostatic system, but Garmin says they want it. You see what I'm saying? So, alternate static's there. Circuit breakers are always there. We got two glove boxes. We got cabin air and cabin heat now here. Um, and this, and, and the cool thing is like, 
if we ever got to the point where there's a lot of these panels out in the world, a 172 and a 182 and a 185 would all be exactly the same, um, the exact same interface. So you have your switch panel in nearly the same location on all of them. The PFDs will always be centered, the radios will be always completely centered, and all these controls, if you got into 185, the throttle's here, if you got into 172, the throttle's still there, generally. Um, so that's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we built this too, so this is our, um, it's being prototyped right now, this is the last prototype, I get, and then we're gonna go into production with it, but this is the final um, power distribution mm -hmm. unit, or M MP master power unit. PDU, power distribution unit. Anyway, so this is this is this is everything on the firewall. This is all that wiring that's running all over the place. This is how to sum that up for our panel specifically into into a clean little unit that's not prone to a bunch of grease and moisture and water and nastiness. And then we have our regulator here. So, I mean, the whole kind of goal is get all the runs as short as possible, limit shorts. Because mm -hmm. um, a real big problem with this stuff now, too, is if you if you have a short, you lose all your glass. It's gone. Ground power unit solenoid, starter solenoid, and we got our master solenoid. These are all connected on one bus. Mm -hmm. This bus bar comes over, splits the power distribution to bus one and bus two for PFDs the way a new Cessna does. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have our shunt, and then we have our exit wires coming out. So these are independent circuits. The most essential items, like your um, PFD, they cross-feed. So if either of these circuits fails, either one can fail and you'll still get power to your PFD. If both of them fail, you won't have power to anything. But if one fails, you might lose your strobes. If the other fails, you might lose your flaps. Uh, this way you're going you're, you're gonna to keep the essential equipment, like your starter, your PFD, your backup EFIS, and then we've got fuses to protect the sense wires for like the shunt, because um, those are, even though they're they're just sense wires, they're still carrying high current, they could shut the system down if they trip, so we've got a sacrificial fuse in it, which is old school, but it's, um, it's a reliable. Cessna is the same thing. Well, it's reliable and it really shouldn't trip. I mean, if it trips, you just gotta open this thing up and say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. and really you should be, you should be, you know, why, why is, you know, why is it tripping? Right. Um, and then we've got, we didn't have enough space in these models to internally mount the regulator. Um, the other thing we did, we consider a lot is um, variables with, with other people, right? So we didn't want to commit somebody to let's say the plane power alternator regulator by putting it in here and building the whole box around it. Um, so I would like it to be more integrated, but we, we voted not to do that for this reason. This was just originally on the firewall. Putting it here is still just as neat. So we didn't drill any holes in this so that they can use this regulator, some other regulator they prefer. Um, and the other thought is too, we might sell these master power units separately um, to home builders or something. We thought, yeah, we, we can sell this to anybody. As part of our panel kit order, just experimental people. Well, I'm gonna sign off here, you guys. Hey, okay. it was awesome to, uh, to meet you guys. I really uh, respect the work that you do. I learned a lot, and I think the biggest takeaway for me is a pre-buy, especially with folks that know Cessna. If I were gonna be buying a Cessna, uh, that'd be uh, kind of a no-brainer. We found quite a lot of stuff on a really nice airplane. So I don't know a lot about Cessnas, I learned a lot. Um, I really appreciate you guys having me out here, and we're gonna uh, probably get together in the future. I wanna see this rotisserie put together so they're not juggling wings, but anyway, it's been awesome. Um, we're gonna say goodbye to uh, Jughead and Larry. Uh, from Backcountry 182. Jughead, what's your uh, channel? Jughead Council. All right. Good luck. So unfortunately, I had to run and catch a flight, but I hope you learned a thing or two if you're in a pinch and need to assess the plane yourself. I know I did. Thanks again to Kyle, and I'll be helping him get Bushliner's YouTube channel going. Look forward to that. And I look forward to building and flying my Rand's tail dragger up to Northern Washington to do some sandbarring with Larry, Jughead, and Kyle. Thanks to VREF for sponsoring this two-part episode. I think it's a perfect pairing since we're talking about arming ourselves with as much data as possible going into a purchase agreement and making that big investment. Well, a huge part of that is having an accurate appraisal of the aircraft so you don't pay too much. VREF is the industry standard aircraft valuation service. They consider market conditions, aircraft modifications, damage history, and more. I've used the VREF service a handful of times in both my search for my first Bonanza rest in peace, and now my second Bonanza, and have felt confident when making an offer. 
You send them the data on the plane and they provide you a detailed value estimate fast, usually within an hour. And it's affordable, especially when you consider the value VREF provides you. It's even more affordable if you're an AOPA member. VREF offers many more services as well. Check them out at vref.com and tell them Steve sent you. Until next time, you're cleared to rent.